Radio. You're listening to PetLifeRadio.com. It's OBA with Arden Moore, the show that teaches you how to have harmony in the household with your pets. Join Arden as she travels coast to coast to help millions better understand why cats and dogs do what they do. Get the latest scoop on famous faces. They're perfectly pampered pets in Who's Walking Who in Rin Tin Tinseltown. From famous pet experts and best-selling authors to television and movie stars, you'll get the latest buzz from wagging tongues and tails. Garner great pet tips and have a doggone fur-flying fun time. So get ready for the pause and applause as we unleash your all-behave host, America's pet edutainer, Arden Moore. Welcome to the Old Behave Show on Pet Life Radio. I'm your host, Arden Moore. Now, got pet? Of course you do. That's why you're listening to this show. You know, in so many wonderful ways, dogs, cats, and other pets, they bring out the best in us. They unleash joy and laughter. I mean, admit it. After you're working at your job and you're wading through that sluggish rush hour traffic, you look forward to coming home, don't you? Because you know your pet's going to greet you like a legendary rock star. It's a great feeling. Now, I'm betting that many of you tuning in right now also make your living in the pet industry. Be it as a, a pet sitter, a dog walker, a trainer, a veterinarian, animal shelter staff, or groomer, or some other pet profession. The demands required to care for pets belonging to others are not easy. I mean, everything isn't always warm and fuzzy, is it? And as much as you try to be that superman or that superwoman and find the right solution to rescue every pet and solve every problem, you can't. And you may sometimes feel frustrated. You may feel angry. You may feel powerless. But on our show today, we're fortunate because we have a multi-talented person. She has the courage and knowledge to talk about a hush-hush topic affecting people in caring professions. Now, she's going to shine a spotlight today on a condition known as compassion fatigue. It is real, and it can and does impact your health and your life. The good news is this woman has been honored as a professional pet sitter of the year. Since 1994, she's owned a company called Special Pet Care Services. She's up in the Seattle area now. She now has a new title. She's a certified compassion fatigue instructor and a new author. I want us all to join in welcoming to our show the one, the only, Holly C. Cook. Hey, I'm so glad you could be here today, Holly. Thank you for having me, Arden. That was like the world's longest introduction, but I had to tee it up, you know? <laughs> I understand. <laughs> now, I listeners, understand. we're going to get some healing here today. Now, move over, Dr. Phil. We got Holly C. Cook in the house, and uh, you're going to learn, you know, exactly what the heck is compassion fatigue, and how do you know if you have it, and more importantly, what can you do to deal with it? Yes, Holly is here to help us out, but we got to pay for the show, so you know the drill. Sit and stay. We'll be right back after this commercial break. Time for a pause. For furry ones, actually, sit and stay. All Behave will be right back. It's designerpetsweaters.com. Hand-knitted designer sweaters for your precious pup or cool cat. Beautiful couture patterns for your pets, including custom-knitted formal wear, casual wear, yachting, and even sports-themed. Many designer pet sweaters include feathered tammy hats, top hats, and a lot of sparkle. Each sweater includes leg loops, front paw sleeves, and leash opening. Visit designerpetsweaters.com to order your four-legged fashions today. Your pets will stay warm for the winter and be runway ready. Large or small, we fit them all. Designerpetsweaters.com Let's Talk Pets on PetLifeRadio.com All Behave is back with more tail-wagging ways to achieve harmony in the household with your pets. Now back to your fetching host, America's pet edutainer, Arden Moore. Welcome back to the Old Behave Show on Pet Life Radio. I'm your host, Arden Moore. Our special guest today is a real diamond in the roof. Yes, I'm talking about Holly C. Cook. She is a professional pet sitter and dog walker and a certified compassion fatigue instructor. And let's just add the title, Breakthrough Author. That's because she has a real game changer of a new book for pet professionals and others who feel, you know what I'm talking about, you're feeling like you're drowning in all the must-dos. The book is called My End of the Leash, Compassion Fatigue from a Pet Sitter's Perspective. Now, I've known of Holly 
But I finally got to meet her in October when she presented at the Pet City Knowledge Conference in Vegas, baby. Her talk on compassion fatigue brought out a lot of Kleenex boxes. Her talk was raw, her talk was real, and her talk was healing. Whew. I got to get the Kleenex. Bo- oh, wait, here's my Kleenex box right here, Holly. So I'm ready for you. You know, let's just, <laughs> okay. let's just say, I mean, what inspired you to write? came from um, the necessity for me to heal my own self. I had to dig really deep and go really far back to figure out how I ended up on the journey that I ended up on and why I let myself get so far into this before I decided to get some help. So the book was healing for me. Well, you know, you start in the book as a four-year-old child with a German shepherd named Rusty. And Mm -hmm. share what happened with you when you were giving a dog a little bit of affection. (laughs) Well, I, I remember this one way. My dad remembers it a completely different way. My memory is that I was sitting on the front porch with my best friend, Rusty, and this dog was the most magnificent German Shepherd. And he was my best friend. And I'm, I'm four years old, so I'm sitting on the top step of my porch with my feet planted on the, on the step below. And I've got my arm wrapped around my dog. And I'm eating an ice cream cone. And I just remember feeling so much love and so much emotion for this dog that I dropped my ice cream cone and I hugged him because I just had to show him how much that I loved him. And so I you love this him- dog more than the ice cream? For a four-year-old, for a four-year-old, that's pretty paramount. Absolutely, this dog was my best friend. So I just wrapped my little arms around him and I squeezed him as hard as I could and told him how much I loved him. And he bit me in the face. Yikes! It was deserved, um, and I understood that at that age. I understood that it was my fault because I squeezed him too hard, and that was just <laughs> his way of telling me, "Hey, look, you are squeezing me a little bit too hard. Kind of back off a little bit." And I understood that at that age. Even then, I understood that I was responsible, you know, for that bite. He bit me in the cheek, broke the skin a little bit. Um, I got a couple of stitches, but I learned a very valuable lesson at that point was that I needed to learn how to listen to what animals were telling me because they're smart, and if we listen to them, they'll tell you exactly what you need to know. And animals were a big part of your whole growing up. Now, you grew up outside of in Michigan somewhere, is that right? Mm-hmm, yes. Okay. So I know that all you Michigan folks, I know you're sticking your hand out right now trying to figure (laughs) out where on the hand is the state of Michigan where Holly was. So help us out with all those people sticking out their hands right now. Okay. So if you put your left hand out, um, put your left uh, hand out, (laughs) with the back of your hand facing you, so you're looking at the back of your hand. I grew up right about where the knuckle of your thumb is on Lake Michigan or Lake Huron. Oh, Oh, okay. All right. So I lived probably a half an hour from where the Blue Water Bridge crosses from Michigan into Canada. Oh, Canada, eh? Okay, well, Mm -hmm. you and I both grew up in the tundra because I grew up outside of Chicago and Lake Michigan. So I'm not sure which Uh one was nastier, Lake Michigan or Lake Heron, because when that winter came, you know, do you ever see when the waves would just freeze in (laughs) mid-stride? They look like... I've never actually seen that happen, (laughs) Oh, my gosh. You get that northeast wind blowing, and those those waves start crashing, and the, the lake effects snow starts snowing, and it's magical, if you ask me. So your family's kind of near Lake Huron. I got my hand back down now. I, I was doing my knuckle thing, like you, like you told me. And you just had a natural affinity for um, dogs and cats in need in your neighborhood. And you did have pets. I know you had Sparky and some other ones. But, I mean, is there something in your genetic pool that had a bunch of uh, animal lovers in your past? Or are you the start of this family tree? That's actually a very good question. I thought I was the beginning of the family tree or that I had picked some of this up from my grandmother, my dad's mother, um, because she always had poodles, um, Mm -hmm. little toy poodles. But after I wrote the book and I sent one to my dad to read it, it turns out that my dad has an affinity for animals as well. He just didn't show it. He had his own story of heartbreak with a dog. So when I grew up, I thought my dad was not the animal person in our family. But after he read the book, he set me straight. So it is a genetic genetic inheritance that I got from my dad's side of the family. My mom as well. She had Mm -hmm. a passion for animals as well. But I think that I went one step further than they did as far as how to care for animals and how far I bonded with them. But it was just something that came to me naturally. 
And you had this dog named Toots, and you know you're younger than me. But back in the day, folks, people used to put big dogs in the backyard with dog houses, and they didn't get to come in the house. Now, I'm sorry, I had a husky golden retriever that made my vacuum work overtime, and there was no way Chipper was ever going to be out there. But you were a young child; right. that was kind of some of the mindset back then. But you right. forged quite a, a bond with Toots. Yeah, she was my. She was my best friend when we moved. When she came home, I believed that she was going to be a house dog. I thought she was going to live in the house with us because, you know, the dogs prior to to Toots all lived in the house with us. But when we moved, for some reason, she wasn't allowed in the house. So my dad brought her home, and he also brought a dog house and a chain home with her. And so he said that she had to live outdoors in a dog house by the garage. And because she was a, an Alaskan Malamute mix, he figured that she was going to be just fine out there. And my job was to feed her and water her and take care of her. And being, you know, the person that I am, I took that one step further and kind of internalized that, okay, this is my dog. This is how I'm supposed to take care of her. And I took care of her the way I would want to be taken care of if I was a dog that had to live outside. And that means you were the first person to start that whole tiny nation houses because didn't you read Tiger Beat in the dog house? <laughs> yes, I did. <laughs> See, you were, you were ahead of your time. You didn't even know that. You yes. were doing tiny nation right there. I was a groundbreaker and I didn't even know it. <laughs> yes, actually, I had um, I had a blanket in there. I had a flashlight in there. I had books in there. I would read um, my Nancy Drew books in there with her. As I got a little older, my Teen Beat magazines would go in there with her. Um, and she would just snuggle up with me, put her head in my lap, and I would read to her. Sometimes I would take, you know, my lunch out there and share my lunch with her out in, the, in her doghouse. So I guess that was my tiny little house as well. <laughs> Now, it wasn't fun, I guess. Um, I know, like most people, life hits you in the face. It doesn't matter how old you are, where you live, what your zip code is, or your money status. But, you know, as a child, you went through a a divorce, I guess, and you got bullied a bit. I did. I'm little. Your listeners are are not going to know how big I am, but I'm only about five foot You have a very tall phone voice, though. That's good. That's good. you got a tall radio (laughs) voice. Well, maybe I'm made for radio and not TV. I don't (laughs) know. Okay. I don't know, but I'm 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 a tiny person. I'm short, and I have the personality that you know I'm I'm good with the animals. But I'm not so great with people. And the bigger girls, the older girls in my neighborhood decided that maybe I would be you know a good person to pick on. So I was kind of a target. And there were several times where they would just gang up on me, you know, and and do what bullies do. And I would go home and try to tell my mom. And then I found out my mom was having her own issues with bullies. Same family of people were bullying our family. So I kind of internalized all of that and and tried to protect my mom and keep my mom from battling the bullies' mothers. And I just kind of took it. Just, you know, kind of took my lickens and confided in my dog and just tried to stay away from them. I found that when I spent time with my dog, I felt safe. I didn't feel like I was going to be bullied if I was hanging out with my dog or if I I was out walking a dog or, you know, even the neighbor's dogs. They seemed to just stay away from me. So that just reinforced in me that dogs were good and that if I spent my time with my dogs, I was going to be safe. Yeah, and naturally it seems like you gravitated to a career in the pet field and you know, being a mm-hmm. pet sitter back in 1994, you're one of the first, you know, professional pet sitters. It's not that old of an industry when it comes to being professional, certified, trained. So that was kind of a gutsy, broad move, wouldn't you say? I would say it was gutsy, but I would also say that it was natural. It was just Good. a natural thing for me to do. Once I did my research and I got, you know, insured and I got my contracts and I got all the legalities out of the way and I could actually go into this field. I guess I was a a groundbreaker where I was in Michigan. Mm -hmm. I was the first professional pet sitter in Michigan in my area. And my company is still running today. Um, I have a business manager who is still running things in Michigan and the company is still serving the area where I grew up. And I'm proud of that. But along with my education, I had to educate the public about what a professional pet sitter did you know, what the standards were for a professional pet sitter. So I kind of dragged my community along with me as I grew. Yeah, Yeah, because the tiny house, you know, on HGTV hadn't started yet. Mm -hmm. You had to do something, right? (laughs) That's right. I couldn't (laughs) build tiny houses yet. (laughs) But you did, is it, help me on the date, 2006 is when you got the big high honor from Pet Sitter International? 2004. 2004, and you were named Pet 
well, it's Professional Pet Sitter of the Year for the uh, founding um, organization of Professional Pet Sitters started by Patty Moran. But, I yeah. mean, you got probably like a new house, a new car, right? No, oh, no. Darn. No. <laughs> I got, I was, I was honored to win that award. That award was given to me by Pet Sitters International, but it was actually nominations from my clients that got me that award. I was very happy to get that award because it meant my clients thought that I was doing a good job. I got to go to San Antonio to get my crown and there was a ceremony for me to get my crown. But I, when I got back to Port Huron and I got back to, to work, my clients were impressed but my community was not because they still weren't quite sure what it was that I did. So I still had to continue educating the public about what professional pet sitting was. Right. And you said something early on with when you were talking about you and your mom, you internalized a lot of things. So if, yeah. you know, you have gone on a pretty uh, major life soul searching journey, you've gotten people that could help guide you and all that. It hasn't been mm-hmm. an easy, easy uh, route. But if you could tell people what the heck is compassion fatigue? And it, it's sort of something that I think kind of sneaks up on people. I think it does sneak up on people. I think that a lot of people in the pet care industry are just learning about it. I don't think that it's something that is talked about, but I do believe that it's it's an epidemic. I believe it is an epidemic in our industry because of pet sitting still being fairly new. Compassion fatigue started to be studied in the healthcare field in the 1970s with doctors and nurses and, you know, people who take care of people. It got closer to the late 90s, early 2000s when they started to study compassion fatigue in people who worked with animals, veterinarians, animal shelter workers, but nobody has studied what it does to pet sitters. Now, compassion fatigue is It has to do with the work that you do. Burnout has to do with where you work, and it can be even be associated with a person that you work with. But compassion fatigue is something that's internal, and it has to do with the work that you do. Now, say that, like, picture yourself as a sponge, and you're just full of the traumas that you have seen, the bad clients that you have dealt with, the sick animals that you've dealt with in the course of your career. And it doesn't matter how long you've been doing it, and it matters how full your sponge is. And after a while, you just can't take any more. And that's how I feel compassion fatigue affects people. You just can't take any more, and your sponge is soaked through with the traumas and the the, the grief that you have endured during the course of your career. And it, it doesn't matter the size of the trauma. It doesn't matter the size of the grief. What matters is how full your sponge is. No, that's, that's a very, yeah, that's an amazing, great analogy. And thank you. on her homepage, listeners, it's hollycook.com. We're going to talk after this commercial break. There's actually a, a quiz that she has to help you a little bit figure out where you are. So we're going to learn about that quiz. Don't worry. Everybody's going to get an A. No pressure. <laughs> but we got to pay for this show. So everybody just sit and stay. We'll be right back. Time for a walk on the red carpet, of course. All Behave will be back in a flash right after these messages. Hi, I'm Dana Humphrey, the founder of Whitegate PR. We have been specializing in PR and marketing in the pet industry for over 10 years. If you have a pet product or service you would like to promote, give us a call. We can help create awareness for your brand on TV, radio, magazines, newspapers, and blogs. Feel free to reach me directly at 619-414-9307 or learn more on our website at whitegatepr.com or follow us on Facebook. Let's talk pets. Let's talk pets. On Pet Life Radio. Pet Life Radio. PetLifeRadio.com. Hi, this is Mandy Moore, and you're listening to Oh Behave on Pet Life Radio with your host, Arden Moore, who's now family. We figured that out. We're back from the lot. Just checked the paper, and we had a record showing at the box. The letterbox, that is. Now back to Oh Behave. Here's Arden. Welcome back to the O Behave Show on Pet Life Radio. I'm your host, Arden Moore. We have Holly C. Cook in the house, and she is the author of a pretty breakthrough book, and it's really going to help, I think, many in the pet industry. It's called My End of the Leash, Compassion, Fatigue from a Pet Sitter's Perspective. And as we were starting to talk a little bit into this about the sponge analogy, I like that very much, Holly. You actually, on your homepage... 
talk about some of the questions you're asking these people that visit your site and what inspired you to say, I'm going to put a quiz out there. Well, the quiz is not mine. I know I that. To, you give credit. <laughs> okay, yes. I have to give credit where credit is due. The quiz is not mine, it, but it is a very useful tool to figure out if you're suffering from burnout or if you're suffering from compassion fatigue and how far down the road you actually are. This quiz gives you the information that you need to take to either go buy a workbook or go see somebody who can help you or just as a self-inventory to say, oh my, um, maybe I need to indulge in some self-care. Maybe I need to build up my resiliency. So this quiz is a very powerful tool. So you take the quiz, you get your number. I don't know why scientists feel that they have to transpose emotions into numbers, but they all I don't do. Know. I know. <laughs> I don't get it, but they do, I guess. Well, we try to get but, Freud on here, but he says he's up in heaven, so he wasn't going <laughs> to, he doesn't have any Skype or any, you know, uh, landline right? up in heaven, so I couldn't ask him. So, yeah, I was trying to get all the psychologists. It's, it's, it's an interesting concept to me of why they take your emotions and, and transpose them into numbers, but I guess you can work with numbers better than you can work with emotions. So they, so you get your numbers from this quiz, and then it tells you how to go to work, what you need to work on, and you go to work, and in six months, you take the quiz again to see if the work that you've done actually has paid off. And this quiz is powerful. It's a great tool. I like it. It's at hollyccook.com. Now, don't forget the C, everybody, because that's probably, I don't know who Holly Cook is, but the Holly C. Cook is the one you want to go to. And this book just came out, right? Yes, it just came out at the end of July. Wow. And so how do people get their paws on my end of the leash? I know there's different routes. Here's your chance. Be a seller. There's two ways you can do it. Sell my book. Um, you can go to Amazon.com and search for My End of the Leash, and you can purchase it through Amazon. Or if you want a copy that has is personalized and signed by me, you can go to the website and purchase it through the website. Okay, that sounds good. That sounds good. So I don't want to give out all the answers, but, you know, do you think when, you know, all right, let me back this up. When you were talking at the Pet Sitting Conference and you took the stage, mm-hmm. you sat down. I think you, did you take your shoes off? Yeah. Okay. Well, you I did, did. have, you did have off. clean socks because there was no odor detection. Um, <laughs> and you just kind of got in a comfortable chair. It was a very yeah. novel way to approach because normally when you go to conferences, there's all this big flashy PowerPoint and people walking yeah. back and forth on stage, grabbing the mic and booming it out. But your approach right. was different, and it probably needed to be different. So I'm not yes. the expert. You are. Actually, that, we wanted to do a fireside chat sort of atmosphere. Had I had my way, we would have dimmed the lights, and everybody would have been sitting on the floor on pillows, you know. <laughs> yeah. But I wanted it to be a comfortable setting because the topic is difficult for me to talk about because I talk about my story, but it's also difficult for people to hear And when I tell my story, I have to preface it by saying, you know what, just by listening to the things I'm going to tell you, you're going to experience trauma. And I don't like to do that to people. But in order for them to understand that trauma affects them, I have to tell them my story. And that's why we had so many boxes of Kleenex going around the room. And I put myself in a position where I wanted to be on the same level because deep down, I'm a pet sitter. I'm no different than the people that I was talking to. I'm no different than anybody that's listening to your show. I am deep down, I'm a pet sitter and a dog walker. And I needed to be on the same level with them so that they understood that just because I had suffered from something and I wrote a book doesn't make it any different. I'm just telling my story so that they understand, people understand that this happens. And the reason this is so important to me is because it's life altering and we've lost people to compassion fatigue because they've decided to take their own life because they couldn't handle the traumas that they had gone through. So it's important to get the word out, to get people to talk about it and to get rid of the stigma that comes from compassion fatigue or burnout and even depression and anxiety. It's okay. And we can talk about it. When you presented, because I'm an ex-newspaper reporter, I'm busy tapping my keyboard, writing down everything you're saying. You rattled off 15 symptoms of compassion fatigue. And a few of them, you got bone tired exhaustion, difficulty sleeping, apprehension, anxiety, clumsiness, clumsiness. Mm -hmm. Tell us about that Mm -hmm. because you said the brain signals aren't really shaking hands with the body. Exactly. So the clumsiness is simply just tripping over your own feet. 
or carrying, you know, a glass of water and, and dropping it and not just like not understanding why is my hand not holding on to this glass of water. It's simple little things that you think, okay, I'm going too fast. I need to slow down. But it's clumsiness. It's plain and simple. Your brain is so focused on doing other things that it's the signals are crossed and it feels like the wiring in your brain is just not working correctly. And then the other one that was a little bit surprising for me is you could be a nice person and all of a sudden you're becoming snarky to people. Yes, yes. And the people that you are snarky to are the people that you love the most because they can take it. At least you feel like they can take it. That snarkiness and the anger um, and and the resentment that comes with it is sneaky and it'll sneak up on you. And you will find that, for me anyway, I found towards the, as the battle started to come into focus for me and I started to notice that there was something actually wrong. I didn't know what it was yet, but something was actually wrong with me was when I had a client call and say, we're going to put our dog down at the end of the week. And this is a dog that I had been caring for since she was a puppy. Um, 16 years I had been with this dog and it was time. It was time. She was very old and she was very sick, but they set a date and they set a time for, for this to happen. And they asked me if I would come in for the course of the week and do lunchtime visits with her and do hospice care until Friday rolled around and it was time for her to go. And I was angry with this client, not only because they were making the dog live another week, but they were subjecting themselves and me to the trauma of hospice care for this dog. And I did my best, but what changed for me was that instead of being able to give the care that I knew this dog deserved, I cried for the entire visits that I had with her for that week. And that's not my style. That's not how I do things. I will put things away and we'll deal with it later in the shower or when I get home. I've got a job to do and I'm going to do it to the best of my ability. I could not pull that out of me. I could not pull the best of my ability out of me. So I sat with her and I cried. And at that point, I knew that there was something really, really wrong. There was something going on. So when the dog finally passed and they called me to tell me that the dog had passed, She was expecting, the owner was expecting some solace from me and some help with her grief, and I couldn't give it to her. I didn't have it in me to give to her, and I tried my best, but the fact that I couldn't console her and I couldn't help her with her grief because I had so much grief of my own to process was a red flag for me that something was going on and I needed to dig deep to find out what was happening. No, that's great. And folks, I mean, she's raw. I told you she's raw. She's I think you're <laughs> you're sharing your story because there were a lot of people nodding their heads and sharing mm-hmm. some very very personal traumas that have affected them. I mean, you talk about building resiliency in your book and I I like yes. the analogy. We had the sponge, now we're going to silly putty. Silly putty. <laughs> Explain what you mean by that. Silly putty. Okay. So if you think of the word resilience, you think, I think of silly putty because silly putty is one of the most resilient compounds around. You can manipulate it. You can throw it. You can, no matter what you do to it, it always regains its bounce. Always. You can take it and flatten it out on a piece of newspaper, but if you water it up again, it regains its bounce. So to me, being resilient is like being silly putty. So if you take that analogy into your life and into the way you take care of yourself, You want to be silly putty because you always want to be able to bounce. So you're not going to take in the negative emotions of an event. You're not going to, whatever happens to you, it's not going to lay you out flat. You're going to be able to regain your bounce and you're going to be able to go on with your work. So you have to become a resilient person in order to continue to do the work that you love to do. But in order to become resilient, you have to take care of yourself. So resiliency plus self-care is what takes the oomph out of compassion fatigue. That's very good. And now you did talk about eating well, exercising, and uh, yeah. getting some sleep. But I'm not going to give all the tools away, but you, you identify eight tools to help yes. this resiliency. You want to share a couple of them? Well, there's more than eight, obviously. Okay. It all depends on the person that you are and okay. what you like to do. But there are eight tools that I like to use because they're easy to keep track of and you can monitor them. So if you start with your diet, of course, and these are all things people are going to groan about. They're going to roll their eyes and say, oh, God, why is, she talk- why is she talking about this? My doctor says stuff like this. And I know, that, I know that people hate to talk about this stuff. But it's important that we take care of ourselves. So there are eight tools. And under the eighth tool of practicing self-care comes nutrition, exercise. you got exercise, sleep, mindfulness, sleep. right? Yep. 
and family and friends. Yeah. So those are the five things that you can actually do right today. You can start today. You can monitor these things today. You can change these things today. This is the way to start to build resiliency for yourself. So the nutrition aspect is obvious. You know, eat good food. And I feel like it's Wait a minute, important. I got to put away the Cheetos I've been crunching on right now. <laughs> It's okay to eat the Cheetos as long as you eat an apple later. Okay, okay. So I'm, not well. saying to, I'm not saying to deprive yourself of the things that you love. Maybe you just need to add some fruits and vegetables to your diet. So, okay. so I'm not talking about going on a strict diet. I'm just saying that you need to take responsibility for the things that you put in your mouth. You know right. what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So then another thing would be sleep. Now, I have taken it upon myself that, that I word this, that it's your responsibility to get good sleep. It's your responsibility because if you don't sleep well, your brain doesn't work well. And if your brain doesn't work well, you don't make very good decisions. It's a physical thing. It's a mental thing. So it's your responsibility to get good sleep. And that's all I'm going to say about sleep. Okay. (laughs) Well, like today, I mean, I think people, I have a gym membership today. I went this morning and worked out. But you know what I'd rather do? I'd rather hitch up Kona ice cream cone Mm -hmm. to my Mm -hmm. harness. And when the weather in Texas isn't... uh, nasty we go on long long walks and we go to different places and it's just so nice to just be walking the dog and casey my cat would do it but he would prefer being in an automobile (laughs) don't blame him well that falls under exercise and exercise is important but it's not something that you have to go out and buy a gym membership or hire a trainer to do it's something simple like taking the dog out for a walk without your phone or if you like, or have your like, phone what did you? In, your, in your back pocket and just, you know, because I think it's these days it's nice to have a phone in case you need it. But I agree with no, you. I don't want to be looking at my phone when I'm with Kona. Right. So and the other thing that you can do is, is remember the stuff that you like to do as a kid. I love to figure skate. I was a figure skater when I was a kid. So any chance I get, I put my skates on and I go figure skating because that's what I love to do. I have a friend who loves hula hoops, so this is what she does when she's stressed out is she takes her hula hoop out and she hula hoops. So, I mean, instead of forcing yourself to exercise, which releases the stress hormones in your brain, which we're trying to fight, do something that you enjoy. So if it's walking your dog, go walk your dog. If it's riding your bike, go ride your bike, whatever you can do. And it doesn't have to be, you know, for an hour, 15 minutes will help your brain to decompress and it will release the happy hormones in your brain, which are the things that we're looking for. Now go watch a silly cat video, right? That might work as long as you laugh hard enough. <laughs> okay, well, I, I will do that. Or I'll let Casey do his thing because my cat, the orange tabby, is quite a comedian too. You know, folks, Your we're, cat we're, is awesome. Casey rocks. And we hope that you get to meet Casey and Kona someday because they, they travel all over the country with me. And I'm very blessed for a couple of shelter alums. They up my mm-hmm. game. But I think a lot of folks have been through things. You know, life isn't easy. But right. I think having pets and being able to really be honest with yourself and provide these outlets. You know, folks, her book explains a lot of good strategies on how to conquer this thing called compassion fatigue. And and she's a pioneer in this when it comes to folks in the pet industry. And I know you're working on an audio book and a handbook. I mean, your whole career is taking a shift now. You see a need yeah. and you're trying to fill it. Yeah, and it's it's difficult to say the least. There's days I think, what am I doing? Because I've I mean, I'm going from owning a business and being a dog walker to writing a book. And so I went from a very active to a very sedentary kind of position. And I'm using my brain a lot more than I used to. So it is a difficult shift, but I feel that it's important. And if it saves one life, then it's worth the work that I'm putting into it. All right. Well, before we say goodbye, I want you to do a shout out to your fur family and your two-legged family because they've been listening. You know, they're all going to, we've got 800,000 listeners worldwide. So time to shout out to your family. My family. Well, that would be my dad. My mom has passed, so I'm sure she's watching over me. But that would be my dad back in Michigan, um, my brothers and sisters back in Michigan, and then um, Hazel and Mosey, my two dogs, Chrissy and Polly, my two cats, my husband, Tony, and my son, Kyle. Nice. That's a nice family you got there. Holly. Yeah, I like. And you them. got you got cool friends like me too now, right? I do, I do. <laughs> I have you and Trees Capoboda and Josh <laughs> Carey and Kathy Vaughn. You're going to be in San Antonio in February, right? Yes, I am. You're, yes, I am. So I am. So I am. Oh, like, so I'm. You know what? To- I think I might be bringing Casey and Kona. You might get to meet them. Perfect. Then. 
Perfect. Perfect. I will bring my autograph book so they can put their (laughs) paw prints in my autograph book. All right. And they'll do the same for you. Folks, I'm delighted we've had Holly Cook on our show. Her book is called My End of the Leash, Compassion Fatigue from a Pet Sitter's Perspective. Now, after the show, dash over to her website. It's hollyccook.com. There's a lot of great information there, and she's here to help you out. Any parting message you'd like to say, Holly? I just want your listeners to know that they can reach out to me anytime they want to. If I don't know the answers to their questions, I will find someone who does, or I will steer them in the direction that they need to go. I'm not the guru on compassion fatigue. I know my story, and I know what tools work for me. So I I don't want anybody to walk away thinking, okay, I'm suffering from this, and I don't know what to do. I can help, and I can direct. And Moses right, says hello. Mosey! Uh, don't be moseying around. <laughs> Mosey's in the house. Mosey's got a Mosey's good bark. I like. What kind of dog she is does. Mosey? Well, she is a shelter dog, and she looks like a miniature Labradoodle. I uh-huh. don't know exactly what she is, but she has the bark of a warrior. Aww. You know, tell her that Kona ice cream Kona says hi. Okay, I will definitely <laughs> do that. And also, folks, I want to take this time to thank my producer, Mark Winter. He is the Wizard of Paws. He is the executive producer of Pet Life Radio. All those great shows that are on our network, please tune in. We are the number one pet radio network on the planet. And I'm so glad you could be on our show, Holly. Um, I look forward to seeing you in February. Thank you, Arden. I can't wait till February. All right. And so until next time, folks, this is Arden Moore giving two words to all you two three, and four-leggers out there, all behave. Coast to coast and around the world, it's all behave with Arden Moore. Find out why cats and dogs do the things they do and get the latest buzz from wagging tongues and tails in Rin Tin Tinseltown. From famous pet experts and best-selling authors to television and movie stars, you'll get great tail-wagging pet tips and have a fur-flying fun time. All behave with America's pet edutainer, Arden Moore, every week on demand. Only on PetLifeRadio.com.